Hello, I'm Diane Sullivan, your host for this edition of the Educational Forum, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. Since Deborah Sampson in Massachusetts fought in the Revolutionary War, women have played many roles throughout our military history. Today's women are fighting in combat on the front lines of Kuwait, Afghanistan, and Iraq. According to a BBC report, over 200,000 U.S. women have served in the Middle East since 2003. Yet, with few exceptions, their service to our country goes unnoticed, despite the fact that hundreds have been wounded in action and over 100 have lost their lives, many by hostile fire. A few years ago, I sat down with Kirsten Holmstead to discuss her award-winning book, Band of Sisters, American Women at War in Iraq. The book detailed female soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines fighting on the front lines in Iraq. Now Kirsten returns to tell the stories of America's fighting women, returning from Iraq, scarred by the toll of battle, trying desperately to pick up their lives where they left off. Kirsten explains the accomplishments and setbacks our women experienced on the battlefields. I think the challenges that women face on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan have less to do with combat and more to do with fitting in, wanting to fit in or not wanting to fit in with the unit, standing out, um, maybe sexual harassment, military sexual trauma. Um, so it has more to do with the soldiers and the Marines they're working with than the actual combat and doing their job. I think women have proven that they can do their job. It's just that unfortunately um, situations with fellow soldiers and Marines make, make it a little more difficult sometimes. Um, as far as accomplishments, I think what we're going to see from this war is a lot um, women, women have become leaders on the battlefield, which is awesome. They're leading convoys, they're leading security missions, and um, in order for, for anyone to go up in rank in the military, um, to higher rank, you have to have combat experience. So I think that in the future we're going to see a lot more women in higher positions in the military. So Kirsten, what do you ultimately conclude about the suitability of women for combat? Well, my conclusion is that women are suitable for combat, that they can do the job and they can do it well. I think I proved that, um, they proved that, and I showed that in Band of Sisters. Um, so, I mean, I think that the law banning women from combat has to be, um, I think they need to rework that because women are in combat over there and they're just not getting the recognition that they deserve. So allegedly there's a ban on women in combat, right. but in fact women, women will meet later in the show, are in fact on the front lines. Right, they are. They're returning fire, they're kicking down doors, they're being ambushed, they're being hit by IEDs, and they're coming back with the same wounds, physical, mental, um, emotional as the men. And I, I mean, we need to recognize that they're in combat so we can help them when they come back. In your new book, When the Girls Come Marching Home, which I hope everyone reads, it's just as wonderful as the last. They're very sad, um, but we need to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So in your new book, you really focus on women coming back to the United States after having served in combat roles. Mm -hmm. And what do you conclude are some of the major issues that women face when they return home to the United States? Um, major issues include depression, isolation. Um, some, some will talk about their experience over there. Others, if they're still on active duty, say I'll talk about it when I'm finished with active duty. So they're holding it in. Um, women are less likely to act out than men. They're less likely to go out and drink and maybe re be reckless driving. But they, I think they, there's, there's a group of women that, I mean, they talk and talking's healing and there's another group that just holds it in, stays in a corner in the bedroom, keeps the lights off and, and we really need to reach those women. Sure. Yeah. Why did you write the book? I wrote the book because um, I had finished Band of Sisters and started the book tour and I was running into a lot of female veterans and they were telling me their stories about coming back and in some cases the war hadn't started until they came back. It started inside them or it followed them, them home. And there was one instance where I was speaking at a university in New England 
and I saw a female veteran and she said very little to me but I looked into her eyes and I thought she's not done and I'm not I mean I, ne I need to finish um, I was a voice I feel like I was a voice for them which which actually sounds um, I don't know it sounds too big but I feel like I've been a voice for them um, in combat and now I want to be a voice for them when they return home because they're not going to put the spotlight on themselves when they're over there and their accomplishments and they're not going to do it when they come home. That's right and, and thank you so much for doing <laughs> that on their behalf. How do these women go about reclaiming their earlier roles as wives, as mothers, as civilians and who helps them? It's really hard and um, for the mothers you know, a guy comes home from war, a father, and if he's feeling a little anxious or, or restless, he goes down to the local Joe's Bar and Grill, has a couple beers with his buddies, you know, the other soldiers and Marines. A mom comes home, and the grandmother or whoever was taking care of those children says, here, and hands over the children. So that woman is instantly going from soldier or Marine to mom and there's very little time for transition and it's extremely difficult. Yeah. So that transition's really hard as mom. The ones that really concern me the most are the, the younger females, and males too, but the younger females who are wounded emotionally, mentally, or physically, and have to go through some healthcare system and don't have an advocate, don't have an older sister, a mom, a grandmother, um, a buddy to help them through the system. Because personally, I think that even healthy, going through the VA system would be difficult for me and I'm 46. I can't imagine being a 21 year old Lance Corporal trying to navigate that system and that, that's what really worries me. Carson, do you believe that women are ultimately successful in reclaiming their prior lives or does the war experience, so to speak, change them irreversibly? It definitely changes them. I mean, I don't think you can go to war and come back unchanged. But I also think that women are incredibly resilient. I think um, that book, The Girls Come Marching Home, is all about resiliency. And yes, the stories are really sad, but um, to see the women going through physical therapy, going to counseling, taking care of themselves, taking care of their children, still cooking and cleaning <laughs> and working, I mean, um, so um, they, I, th I think they, uh, I think they come back stronger, more courageous, and really there's nothing they can't do once they've been through combat and over there. Wow. Carson, talk about vicarious emotional trauma, if you would, and what the impact was to you personally in writing this book. Sure. Well. I had been interviewing the women for about a year and writing their stories and you know when you write you rewrite and you rewrite and and um, when I interviewed them I'm not a therapist and I internalized a lot of the stories I was really affected I'm very sensitive I guess and and um, I internalized their stories and one day in November of 2008 I sat down at the computer and I just couldn't write and I just started crying. And I was working on C.J. Robinson's story and her story I think affected me the most of all the stories in the book. I, w I was really sad because what I saw was a soldier who was wounded in Iraq and lots of soldiers come back wounded but when she came back how I feel is that the wounds did not break her. What broke her was our country and our health care system and the fact that they didn't roll out the red carpet for her. They didn't take care of her when she came back. And um, she faced so many battles with the VA and trying to take care of herself. And, and she's a master sergeant. She had 18 years in. I mean, this is one tough woman and she could not get the help she needed. And so when I sat down at the computer and just froze and started crying, um, you know, that's I was really feeling it for for CJ, and also I was feeling very humbled and not worthy. You know, because here I am writing about these women who put their life on the line for us, 
and they've all been wounded and I mean you don't come back for more unaffected like I said and here I am just sitting at my safe little computer writing their story so I think um, I was feeling a little unworthy. The women you wrote about you grew to love mm -hmm. and the deeper you got into their world the more trouble you became. Mm -hmm. I mean yeah. how do you ultimately put that all behind you and put a smile on your face and write another book? Well, it's hard because as I just mentioned to you, I mean, when I felt I had a signing yesterday and when I went to sleep last night, I mean, I had tears and um, tears of joy that I'm bringing these women together and they're getting out there and telling their stories and educating the public, which I think is really awesome, but um, just tears having to do with what they went through. And, and secondary trauma is, um, you know, secondary trauma is what a lot of healthcare people go through and counselors. It's um, when you haven't been through the experience yourself, but you're really close to people, maybe a woman who was raped, um, and you just feel that. You just feel it really strongly. And so the best thing for me, I've been in counseling since November, and just I just keep talking about these stories, and the book tour is very emotional. Sure. I mean, there was a gentleman last there last night at this book at this book signing who had lost a son in Iraq. There was another woman who said uh, her son was coming home for two weeks of R and R, and she said, "What do I need to do when he comes home?" CJ said, "Food, television, sleep, and beer." About an hour into the drive, and I exploded next to the driver's side of Robinson's truck. The explosion rocked the Humvee and shot shrapnel into the vehicle. Luckily, none of the soldiers was hit by the flying debris. However, the explosion happened just eight feet from Robinson, and the sound was deafening. It felt like someone had popped the inner tube of a tire next to her ear. She asked the soldiers in her truck if they were all right, but she couldn't hear their responses. Her ears were ringing. She couldn't even hear the voices on the radio. The explosion pissed her off. Kiss my ass, she thought. It's unbelievable when someone attacks you and you can't see them. It's such a chicken shit thing to do. You want to come out and fight? Come out and fight. The enemy can see us, but we can't see him. And I can't see the soldiers behind me to know if they're okay. It was like a nightmare. It was nothing that Hollywood could ever capture. I remember one day thinking, if they had a camera crew here, they still would not get this. That feeling of rage that sparked, I don't think you could get that from any other place on the face of the earth. When the United States was attacked on 9-11, Elaine Snavely was a corpsman stationed on the newly commissioned destroyer USS Winston Churchill. The ship had been at sea for more than a month and was deployed off the coast of Portsmouth, England. Medical and senior staff carried handheld radios to communicate with one another at all times. Snavely was sitting at a computer working on the medical supply inventory when a message came across the radio from the bridge to the commanding officer. It was a flash message, extremely urgent. The CO responded that he was on his way. Within minutes, he got on the ship's intercom system and announced that a plane had flown into one of the Twin Towers. While still on the intercom, the staff received another flash message. The CO announced that a second tower had been hit. Then another message, the Pentagon had also been struck. Snavely, a 27-year-old of Houston, Texas, sat at her computer and wondered if the world would survive these attacks. The day I was injured, um, I couldn't really tell you too much about it. I'm grateful that I don't remember too much. I remember calling my husband, wishing him a happy birthday. I remember going to the security brief, letting people know who was going to be in which vehicle, and since there were going to be four Humvees, who was going to be first, second, and so on. After that, I don't really remember anything. I woke up in Germany trying to figure out why I didn't recognize the ceiling. Ceilings were kind of important when you stared at them for several hours during the night, and I didn't recognize the ceiling. A lady walked into my room asking how I was doing, and I had a few choice words for her. A lot of it was, who are you, and where am I, what am I doing here? 
She told me I had had a small accident in my Humvee two days ago. She then told me that one of the people that were in my, was in my Humvee were killed, but she couldn't tell me who it was, wh where they had been injured, where they were being killed, what the status was of the other two people in the Humvee. She couldn't tell me anything. All she told me was to concentrate on myself. As a corpsman, when you're with the Marines, your job isn't to worry about yourself. Your job is to take care of everybody else. So how did you feel when you didn't know what happened to your friends, your comrades? I threatened to beat her up with my IV pole. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. It wasn't until after I tried to reach for the IV pole that I realized my left arm was in a bandage. I had evidently broken my arm. And, and what, other, what other injuries had you sustained? I sustained a double fracture of my pelvis. I broke a few ribs and I had actually broken my neck. And lucky for us and lucky for you that it wasn't just a little bit higher the spot you broke because as I understand it, that would have left you paralyzed. Paralyzed or dead. So one vertebrae actually separates me from ending up like a vegetable and being around today. I'm very grateful for that one vertebrae. Wilmot had seen wounded male soldiers before, but this was the first time she had seen a maimed female soldier. She returned shaken up to her company. She wasn't feeling like herself. She had been in Iraq for four months now. She thought she had seen it all. She thought that she had learned how to block out her fear of death, that she was able to look past it, that she was invincible. But this death penetrated all those defenses. This hit home, a woman soldier with legs ripped off. I saw wounded male soldiers and Marines before, and it was difficult to deal with. But when I did see a female, and she looked a lot like my partner, it, it really hit home that this could actually happen. And although I had tried to block it out for months that, you know, nothing could happen to me, I'll, I'll be all right, I'll deal with this when I get home, it really was staring me right in the face and I couldn't escape it anymore, that this could be me on the ground or this could be my battle buddy, this could be anyone. And I dealt with it pretty well to that point, and I dealt with it after, but it was just something that it really brought it home, seeing a, a female get injured. Would it be accurate to say that when you arrive in Iraq, you're full of idealism, but you lose that idealism? You find yourself driving around a truck without a radio. Is it accurate to say that your most very basic needs were not being met? Yeah, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, I mean, I was at the very bottom rung, <laughs> and <laughs> it, was, uh, it was tough to deal with, but at the time, you know, I was a pretty motivated sergeant, and uh, I was trying to become staff sergeant, and I was going to deal with it as it came. I knew that the rest of my company had it pretty well in uh, LSA Anaconda, the Green Zone, and Baghdad. I knew what their life was like, and they knew a little bit about what I was going through in Camp Ramadi, but... Um, yeah, my basic needs weren't being met, but I did what I could. I hustled and hustled and hustled until I got what I needed for my soldiers and the uh, Marines that we were treating. It didn't matter. I just got things done, whether it was going out in Lioness or scrounging for materials. Um, I would go, you know, knocking on doors saying, hey, we need uh, extra lumber because, you know, I don't have a bed <laughs> or it didn't matter. Um, I still made things happen and it was difficult to deal with that uh, my company didn't care. Let me ask you each why you join the military. And I'm curious why women do join the military. I understand from Kirsten's book that you wanted to join since you were six. Yeah, I come from a long line of men that have served in the Marines and the Army. And I remember clearly the day that my dad pulled out his dress green uniform with his light blue infantry cord and his fruit salad and how <laughs> dynamic that looked. And I thought, I'm gonna have one of those and mine will be bigger. <laughs> Competitive even at six. At six. <laughs> Elaine. I had always wanted to do something that was better than me, that was bigger than me. Um, it wasn't actually until the Navy recruiter had called me after my ASVAB scores in high school 
to ask if I was even interested. And once I finally decided to listen to what he had to say, only then did I find out that I had actually had a lot of other distant, distant family members in the military that I didn't even know about. I knew they had served, but I didn't know all the ins and outs, and I didn't know all the details. Once I actually enlisted, it was more along the lines of I was actually part of the real family now. I wanted to go to college, and the GI Bill looked really appealing, and kind of the same thing happened. I took the ASVAB test in my junior year of high school, shortly after the Army and Marine Corps recruiters were knocking down my door, <laughs> and it was just the Army side was more persistent. If I had to do it all over again, would have joined the Marine Corps instead. You know that. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was to pay for school, and I figured, you know, what other honorable way to do it than to serve your country and, you know, try to get an education. Why did you and why do women stay? I think I stayed because I loved everything about it. I had um, the best time of my life there. And I think that it kind of goes hand in hand with the first question that you asked me. Fighting in war is, even though it's a nightmare, it's probably when I was at my very best and I saw the very best in other human beings. American service members are the most amazing people on the face of the planet. And being in that kind of environment, it just, um, it is patriotic and it is about God, mom, and apple pie for me. And um, I believed when they told me the things that they told me and I was very proud to be in leadership roles and I, I, I thought I would be the sergeant major of the army when I went to basic training so I had high goals. I had always assumed that I would always do 20 years. Anything less would not seem like it was an actual full service. When my husband and I decided after both of us being deployed with the Marines, one of us had to get out. Otherwise, our marriage wasn't going to survive. We figured that since I had actually spent longer time in uniform, and he had more college-oriented goals, that by the time he got all of his college education and everything else taken care of, I would be about ready to retire at that point. So if I kept the, the money coming in as the act of duty, and he got all of his college education, then by the time that I was ready to retire, he would have the college education, he would have the job security, and then he could provide the money <laughs> and be the, the breadwinner at that point. Michelle. I also wanted to stay um, longer than the eight years I served. Um, I definitely got out because of the experience in Iraq. I do have a lot of friends who do stay in because, I mean, they like the camaraderie that they got. <laughs> um, I didn't get so much of that, <laughs> but um, they do like it and I do agree that you meet some of the best people and I met some of the worst people too <laughs> at the same time, but um, some of my very best friends are all military and it's just that um, there's, um, there's definitely a camaraderie that you never really want to let go of and when you meet other veterans, it's the same thing whether they're from the Vietnam era or Iraq and Afghanistan, there's just some kind of bond that's unspoken and they just know and you know you don't have to say much else. Mm -hmm. Kirsten, when you were writing the book, did you get any sense that a lot of women stayed on in Iraq despite very hard conditions because they didn't want to leave the rest of the people in their troop behind? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I think women, a lot of women wanted to stay on. That's not often their choice. Um, one of the women in the book did stay on, and that was really tough for her. But yeah, like the men, they don't want to leave their buddies, and they feel like they're trained and they know the roads and they don't want to go home. They feel like they can keep the troops safe. So, yeah. Tell us a little bit about some of the struggles that you faced when you came home on a day-to-day -day basis. Everything was a struggle for me. Sleeping, um, not sleeping, not being with the amount of people, not having the type of responsibility I had, and then having two um, children looking at me like I was supposed to know what I was doing as a mom again and I really didn't I really had no idea what I was doing how long were you gone I think we were gone uh, total with training and everything between 14 and 
around 14 months. Mm -hmm. Long time to leave your children. I had an R&R &R in there and I think that was probably the worst thing I could have done was come home halfway through. Elaine, what were some of your difficulties? My biggest challenge was the fact that half of my body was broken. My brain still worked, but half my body didn't have the physical strength to be able to do what I normally would do. I had a wonderful independence about myself that I could get up and go where I wanted to go and do what I wanted to do. And now my world was limited to the lazy boy, the restroom, and the refrigerator. Just that one little circuit was all my body could do. Thankfully, my husband was more than helpful with that. With him being 6'1", me wanting to be held and touched and kissed, I, the best I could do was stand on one step to be halfway decent in height. Because it's not like you can angle your head if your neck is broken. You have to keep everything steady. You have to keep everything straight. So you went to Iraq to fight for our freedom, and in fact, you lost yours, at least temporarily, in the process. I lost mine temporarily, but what I gained was a different perspective. Everybody has, everybody's on some level a little bit jaded. I'll take care of that tomorrow. Well, when you don't even have the physical strength to lay yourself down and sit up in bed, when you need somebody else's help to do that, your world becomes very concentrated on what you can do and how you can approach things. I had to learn really, really early that even though I couldn't do things the way everybody else did them, I could still do them if I approached it from a different perspective. Michelle? Well, a lot of my difficulties had to do with uh, going back to school. Um, I felt really prepared and, you know, had got everything done that I needed to as far as administratively, but um, it was dealing with a lot of people who are 19 years old, 20 years old, who wanted to tell me how the Iraq War really is, and I'm sitting there like, well, I've been there, and you should be asking me or other veterans in this room if there are any. And I think it was um, basically this uh, disconnect that a lot of people think that just because they see snippets of the war on TV that they know what it's all about or just because they watch a certain program that they're some kind of a subject matter expert on the war and you really don't know until your boots are on the ground and you're in it and you have a, a lot of reporters even who have been on the ground might have spent a lot of time at the Al Rashid Hotel in Baghdad and the patisserie so there's really a, a lot of different you know aspects of how reintegration was really difficult for me but um, you know I got through it through um, contacting other veterans that I served with and that's how I kept plugging away and it was really difficult to uh, to deal with uh, coming home being that a lot of people just wanted to challenge me all the time and they had no idea what I had been through. Right. Diane, one of the things that Michelle mentioned to me once and I thought this was great is that for years men have come back from war and we just accept the fact that men have been to war they're coming back and they're gonna have wounds physical mental and emotional but um, because a lot of the public doesn't understand that women have been in combat, these veterans find that the female veterans find themselves having to explain and teach the public and their family and friends about what they've been through on the battlefield and what they're going through when they come home when really they just want to be accepted like the men, which we'll probably get there someday, but we're certainly not there right now. And we'll never get there until people understand that women are playing combat roles mm -hmm. in the war. Mm -hmm. And most of us just didn't know or appreciate that fact. Yeah, I, one colonel said to me, when the guns come out, everyone's in the infantry, <laughs> and these convoys are being ambushed, and there are women on the convoys, and the guns are coming out, they're returning fire, they're in the infantry. Kirsten, in your book, in a different chapter on, I think it was Army Sergeant Stacy Blackburn, mm -hmm. she writes, and well, you write, she informs you that it's one thing to be here in the United States, in Indiana, being mm -hmm. trained to fight and being told that you'll have to face kids and old men. But it's quite another thing to look down the end of your barrel and know that you can take their life. So I guess I'd like to ask the three of you, what is it like to kill somebody? This is something I really want the public to know. Do not ask a veteran 
how many people they've killed, how it felt. It's the worst possible question that can be asked, and it's no offense <laughs> to <laughs> you asking it, but I don't think people realize how how much that really brings up, and it's, it's really such a personal question that I understand that you know people need to know um, what we've been through and what's going on with female vets or veterans in general, but it's really not a good question. Let me, let me phrase it then differently, being the lawyer that I <laughs> happen to be. <laughs> when you're in Iraq, how do you distinguish friend from foe, or do you assume that everybody is an enemy? When we first got there, well, during the entire deployment, we would receive briefings from uh, operation cells that if they had good intel, they would tell you this day the enemy is dressed in black pajamas with green armbands. On Thursdays or whatever day they got married, if they were in the streets with weapons, they were celebrating they were not insurgents or the enemy. And on this day, so it changed every day. Wow. The rules of engagement are what dictate who and who is not the enemy. However, it's your responsibility to protect the, the uh, property and personnel of the United States. The Marines that took care of me were phenomenal. If we ever had any kind of issues, the deal was that they would lay down the cover fire and they would throw me into the Humvee until somebody needed my help. So thankfully I was never in any kind of massive danger of receiving small arms fire or any kind of injuries at that time. I have in the past, but during this deployment to Iraq, I didn't have to worry about that. CJ, what impact was it on your family when you deployed to Iraq? Wow, which which part of my family are you speaking uh, to? Well, my mother, my kids? My, to both. Um, you know, my mom probably explained it the best to me because I really didn't get it. I really just thought, okay, this is what I do for a living and now I've gotten my call, so you need to do what you were supposed to do, and that's just kind of take care of stuff so that I can go do what I need to do, thinking that she would be able to make that click, that switch, and everybody could turn everything off like I could. Because when I was in Iraq, I thought about Iraq. When I was in Iraq, my mom thought about me being in Iraq, and my kids missed their mom, and their, my sister missed her sister, and all the family events I miss, but I didn't get it. And um, you know, they're told not to tell you things that are going on at home that are not going so well, so they don't. But I started getting hate mail from my third grader <laughs> with crayon dug in big circles and stripes down the center and bubbles over my head that said, I'm retired with smiley faces, and the other pictures were her with teardrops. And I thought, you know, why aren't they doing their job at home? This isn't supposed to be happening. And my mom said to me, when I was leaving the TBI Center in Minneapolis, she said, what if it was Amber or Ben in Iraq? Knowing what you know, how would that affect you? And that was like someone throw cold water on my face. I couldn't believe it. I don't think I would be able to, I think they'd have to sedate me. <laughs> and my mom had already gone through Vietnam with my dad and her brother. So I guess I can't imagine what it must be like to have your baby in a place like that. So let me get this right, Robinson said. I'm willing to serve my country and get my ass blown up in the process. All I want is for you to fix my ear. You put me through all this shit at the federal building with a stack of papers like this, send me to the DAV, humiliate me, and now you want to know how much money I make? You have my 214s, certificate of release or discharge from active duty, that show I served in Iraq. Give me the piece of paper that shows me 
that you need to know how much money I make. I don't have anything. I have a poster I can give you. Lady, I'm out of patience and I'm ready to snap you in two like a twig. I'm not going to tell you how much I make. If you want to know, look up how much E8s earn in a combat zone. Then stick that and the means test up your ass. CJ, when you testified at the VA hearing, I'd like you to tell us a little bit what that was like. But also, they asked you how you felt when you were in the crowd. Tell us what your response was. I can't really remember exactly what I said. Uh, most of the things that Kirsten and I talked about when we interviewed, I would have to look at my actual notes. I became a great note taker, so I just know that I don't do well in crowds. I get very anxious and irritated and impatient and um, um, I need to know where the exits are. There's things I, I feel like it's closing in on me. Is that a symptom <clears throat> or a result of your experience in Iraq? Well, the man at the table said that it was. And I think that part of it is from being trained not to have that. Um, you're supposed to have security all the time. I was in a situation where the crowds were moving in on us. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, you know, every, everyone has this grand idea of what PTSD is supposed to be, this checklist and they expect you to fail in these ovals. My ovals are pretty much rectangles and I don't fit into a lot of those categories. I have issues that they say are this or they are that. I've been affected by my experiences in Iraq. Why does it have to have this label? And I take issue with that. So I had to go to a hearing and it wasn't like a courtroom hearing. There was a um, recorder on the table and a man who didn't know me from a hole in his head and my advocate. And they talked to each other. They really didn't talk to me. They asked me a few questions and um, asked me to describe how I felt in this situation and how I felt in that situation. And that just, it didn't seem right because I think people respond differently. But they informed me that that was all PTSD. May I ask both of you, what is your understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder and do you feel that you experienced it in any way? Oh, I know I've experienced it. Um, in what ways? Anger. Just a lot of undirected, just generalized anger, frustration, where I used to think that I was very articulate. If I couldn't find the words that actually made sense in my own brain, it, I automatically assumed that they weren't making sense at all. So I had to constantly modify and refine the way I was trying to get my point across. After about trying to explain something to my own husband who's already also suffered from the PTSD. He's already he's also been deployed with the Marines. After I explained something to him five different ways, he's like, do you honestly think I didn't get it the first time? <laughs> then why didn't you say so? <laughs> because I didn't want to interrupt you and have you angry at me. It, it's a lot of just frustration on the fact that your world doesn't fit around you the way that it used to prior to deployment. Sure. So it's, it's a matter of trying to get your feet back on the ground and make sure that the world isn't tilting at the wrong angle. Michelle? Well, as a mental health sergeant, I've had to read the DSM-4 and now it's the DSM-4-TR, so I'm really familiar with the symptoms and the criteria, but um, the way I've experienced it, um, hypervigilance, uh, irritability through the roof. Um, I had a honeymoon period when I came back from Iraq where things were great until that 19 year old opened up her mouth and everything came crashing down and I wanted to smash a desk over her head. Um, my temper was off the charts. Um, I had insomnia. It was horrible after that incident specifically. 
and I just started to notice, you know, more and more people were, you know, kind of getting a little chirpy in certain classes. I was a political science major, so that didn't help <laughs> at all. Um, but yeah, I had a hard time dealing with that. Keeping my, my temper under wraps was a really, really tough. Um, other physiological symptoms, uh, I know I'm sounding like a medic again, <laughs> but um, just um, stomach problems. Um, sometimes at night, I mean, the uh, reflux is so bad that I have to sleep almost at a, <laughs> almost upright. Wow. So. A lot of that had to do with uh, sleep disturbances and mm -hmm. keeping my, my anger in check. Kirsten, as an advocate for the women returning home, if you will, from, from the war, how does our country handle and treat women soldiers that return home? Well, I don't think they recognize the women soldiers and Marines and sailors and airmen when they return home. I just. I don't, I don't think, you know, that they understand that they're in combat and they, when they see a female, um, they, they assume that the female is a spouse or, or a girlfriend of, of a male soldier. Um, so as an advocate for these women, I mean, I, I feel it's my responsibility to get the word out about what they're doing in combat and what they're going through and educating so that they don't have to. <laughs> Um, and just educating and informing the public and and getting them to purchase these books and just read and understand and and really feel what these women are going through and just just really to get the word out there you write somewhere in your book that the cost of serving is unique to the individual it may result in emotional scars mm -hmm. it may result in lost limbs it may result with the ultimate price and that's death so I have a different question. What is the death of a comrade like? We heard a little bit from you, Michelle, but CJ and Elaine, what is it like when one of your comrades is killed? I think it's probably um, the single most haunting thing for me as a leader to know that I was the last person to have handed down an order and then that soldier doesn't return from the road. And I go back and forth on, you know, what did I say that was a lie? Um, things like, you know, I was really good at rallying troops and it's gonna be a good night. We're gonna, you know, it's everybody's getting back safe and that kind of stuff and all four I felt like I lied to him. And I have uh, uh, this huge debt to pay, and I'm not sure how to get that squared away. I think you already have, CJ. Elaine. It's devastating. Yeah. As a corpsman, your job is to protect the people and make sure they don't die. When the Marines are with you, they take the bullets so that way you can it back together. It's a nice, wonderful, symbiotic relationship, and it's mostly unspoken. The, when you go out, the Marines are supposed to know their job, the corpsmen are supposed to know theirs. If I can't trust for them to protect me, then how should they trust me to be able to put them back together and keep them alive? When someone dies on my watch, it's almost like a a circular logical error process in your brain. You wonder if maybe if you had shown up just 30 seconds earlier, is it possible that maybe you could have done something differently? Could I have had some superhuman strength moment to correct the laws of physics to prevent this person from dying? It's, it's tough. Yeah. It really is. And that's where a lot of the trust issues come. If a Marine gets hurt and he's able to thankfully survive the situation, I'll go back and talk to every single person that's in his unit saying, look, this is what happened, this is what I did, he's fine. And that builds the family unit mentality. Mm -hmm. And they know that if something like that will happen, God forbid, that I will try to do everything in my power, and sometimes even more than my power, just to do my job. 
Are suicidal thoughts a problem for women warriors? I don't think it's gender specific. What was the cost to you personally for serving our country in Iraq? CJ? Uh, the rest of my career. One, I lost the rest of my career. And two, um, I'm so disappointed in, um, I had this huge love for my country. And I still do, but it's certainly different. And I really believe that they loved me as much as I loved them. And after dealing with the Veterans Administration, I've come to realize that I'm really just a number. I'm just a being that's fulfilling someone's order. And that's pretty brutal on the ego. My brain was bruised, my ego is still intact, so it's a problem. Elaine? My cost hasn't been as high as CJ's. I'm still here, I'm still active duty. My family has rallied around me, my husband's been a godsend. I swear I think he needs to be nominated for sainthood for putting up with me through all that crap. I'm still gonna be in, I'm gonna be able to fulfill my dream and do my 20. So the, the cost hasn't been as high for me. The cost has been high for my family. They saw how I was injured. They saw how I got frustrated. But in all honesty, I think I'd do it again. I, wouldn't, I keep what I do remember of the man that died in my accident close to me. So when I get frustrated, I don't end up like in a depression and I don't get frustrated with how little I'm reacting to something on such and such day because I'm still here. I use his memory to motivate me when I get depressed. Michelle? I intended to stay long term in the Army and I think when I got back from Iraq it was just all taken away from me. I mean I was very idealistic going in even though I had problems with my unit. Um, racially, religiously, and because I didn't act the way they thought women should. Um, and my command was predominantly women, which was ironic. <laughs> but um, it cost me my peace of mind. Um, when I went to Ramadi, I mean, to, in order to do our job right, we actually had to get involved. We had to go outside the wire. We had to partake in, you know, the things that the Marines and soldiers were coming in for. and. I think it was Nietzsche who said, you know, if you stare long enough into the abyss, the abyss stares back. And I don't know if I worded that correctly, but it's something along those lines. And I really feel that um, both in the counseling sense and the uh, combat operation sense that that's what happened. I mean, you got to be careful when you're fighting monsters, you don't become one too. So, mm -hmm. and I think um, it really cost me that part of me that I kind of miss sometimes. God forbid if you questioned events, why it was okay for officers to mail weapons home illegally, why it was okay for married officers and non-commissioned officers to have affairs, why alcohol flowed through the green zone despite the Army's anti-alcohol policy and theater, why her team was punished for providing desperately needed medical support for infantry units, why soldiers were promoted based on favoritism and not on ability, why her command expressed disappointment when she showed up to the clinic with a cross drawn in ashes on her forehead for Ash Wednesday. Why her objectivity as a female was questioned. Why the unit's female leaders attacked others for holding soldiers to a high standard. Why she was instructed to give white soldiers special treatment or face punishment. No one was saying anything about any of these infractions. All I'm saying is that if, someone's, if something's going on that's wrong. You're supposed to speak up whether you're an officer or not, but I guess I'm the asshole who actually believed that. How bad was it, Michelle? I think it's the single most demoralizing part of my life. I think I go about every day, and even though I'm smiling and I shake hands, I wonder, how is this person going to hurt me? 
I never used to think that necessarily before, even though, you know, Kirsten did cover parts of my past, and I had felt that I've gone through so much and I've overcome it, and I felt that after the experience in Iraq, I was just starting from square one, just rebuilding with crappy mm -hmm. tools and just doing what I could, and I suspect everybody now. I'm, I'm totally untrusting. What does it take for a woman to be resilient, to survive the war? and now the homecoming? I think it's just who we are. I don't, I don't think there's a platform or a, there's certainly no tool and die set that makes mm -hmm. you that way. Maybe it's just uh, my mom. But I think, I, don't, I didn't see any soldiers that said no. And I didn't see anybody that said I won't go. And I didn't see um, I saw, you know, the, they're, they're people, they're, they're lazy, they're scared, they get tired, but I didn't see people that had the uniform on that said no. And I think that when you can say yes, at the end, there's still hope. And that's pretty resilient. Elaine? It takes a tough person to deploy and then come home. Male, female, black, white, yellow, green, polka dot, whatever, doesn't matter. It takes a wonderful person to be able to accept somebody coming home from deployment without judging them. Let them be who and what they are. Let them have the time they need to decompress. Don't add any external pressure on them. Sorry. Um, and don't make them think that they have to create these high ideals for themselves. Just let them come home, enjoy their food, enjoy their families, enjoy their dogs, enjoy their tall, lanky, crazy husbands, whatever. Just let them be who they are. Let them rediscover who they are. Michelle? I couldn't have put that better myself. <laughs> That's a tough one to follow. Oh. But. No, but it's, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, just being able to come home and just be, just exist, just eat an Arby's roast beef sandwich again, <laughs> something, you know, and just not have people say, you know, what you did was wrong or question you about every single thing you did necessarily and just, you know, come back, be allowed to come back. And I think the biggest problem in reintegration is a lot of people in the general American public don't allow you to come back and you're perpetually feeling like, you know, a service member, a veteran without a country. And I think that's the toughest part about coming back. Karsten, do you wish to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, well, what I'd like to say is one of the things that I learned in interviewing the female veterans is that, and I think this is really important for family members and friends to realize, is that we're more alike than we are different. Um, when you talk about resiliency, lack of resiliency, depression, um, feeling alone, feeling scared, we have all felt that they may feel it for a different reason, there may be a different cause for it, but like I said, we're more alike than we are different. I remember standing outside of Denny's or something with Stacy Blackburn, um, who was in, in firefights over there. and. And um, she's talking about feeling alone, and I, mean, I instantly bonded with that feeling. I'm like, boy, you know, I feel alone for different reasons, but there was an immediate connection there. And um, so, you know, they're talking about giving the veterans space when they come home and stuff. But also, as you're giving them space, um, look for connections, too, maybe. Let me ask each of you what the future holds. CJ? Well, could you have started on that end? Sure, Michelle, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll have a long spiel for this one. Um, <laughs> since coming back, um, you know, I had no intention of going back into the mental health, medical side of the house, civilian or military at all. I was checked out, see you later, don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. I am burnt out, no more. Um, it wasn't until somebody contacted me through Facebook I have a Team Lioness page on Facebook and somebody contacted me and said, you know, what's this Team Lioness all about? They saw the documentary and they wanted to know if they could name one of the houses for a rehab center after Team Lioness. 
So we started talking and she goes, oh, so what are you doing right now? And I was in the process of looking for a job. And I said, well, like many people right now, I'm unemployed. <laughs> so we started talking and she says, well, why don't you send me your resume? Maybe I can help you out with that. And I sent it to her and she calls me back and she goes, wow, I mean, where did this come from? And your resume's fine and you know, how about you come work for us? And she's a Vietnam era vet herself. Her name's Leslie Lightfoot and she's my angel. She made everything reopen up in a great way. And she knew about my background. She, I told her every ugly, gory detail and she didn't run away screaming into the horizon. <laughs> and um, I work for Veteran Homestead Inc. right now, which is a nonprofit organization that helps out uh, injured veterans, whether it's psychological or physiological, we take them. And we're opening up a new rehab center in Gardner, Massachusetts called the MVTRC, or the Northeast Veteran Training and Rehabilitation Center. I'm gonna Wonderful. be the program director and that's opening up October 16th and we're still looking for more funding so the federal and state government still has not stepped up yet but there's still time but um, it's definitely helped me in the process and I think it's overcoming feeling like a victim and becoming a survivor and a leader that really helped me get back on track and she gave that opportunity to me and that's all I needed. Elaine. I think I have the easiest job here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up my 20. I've got 17 years come March, so all I have to do is hold down to four for the next couple of years. My husband's gonna graduate about a year before I retire. I'm planning on getting my massage therapy degree so that way I can stop pushing pills down people's throat and I can actually fix the problem. And because of this accident, it's also made me realize that I wanted to learn how to train service dogs. So all I have to do is somehow figure out how to do that. My already tells. CJ? Well, I have a bucket list now, so I'm working on that. But I think probably, other than being a good mom, I don't know why that took me two people to think that, <laughs> other than being a good mom, I think my, my path isn't with veterans. My path is with the public. The public allowed and offered us all the opportunity to go to Iraq and do what we did by electing officials who thought that that was a good idea. So whether it was wrong or right, then they need to keep their end of the bargain. And their end of the bargain is when I come home and I'm screwed up, I need you to give me a solution, not a backdoor exit not a six month wait. So we talked about this last night and I think the president um, and his family should be invited along with every other legislature to the lowest township to sacrifice their health care and use the VA system until it's fixed and see how long it takes. What last <laughs> message do you have for the audience? One of the things I love, my boyfriend was in a, in a restaurant one day and the waitress had a USMC tattoo on her arm. And if he hadn't read Band of Sisters and didn't know about all the women in the military, he would have just assumed that that stood for her husband or her boyfriend, you know, the USMC tattoo. But because he had read Band of Sisters, he realized that that might, that she might have been in the Marine Corps. So he asked her and she was. And um, so I just, I just want the public to not assume that all the service members coming home are men and to assume that they are women as well. And you know, just recognize them and give them the support that they need, really. We would like to thank CJ, Elaine, and Michelle for taking the time to come and share their stories with us and for their service to our country. We also want to thank Kirsten for continuing to highlight our women warriors in combat situations and the struggles they face when they return home. And finally, we would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of MSL's Educational Forum. So until next time, be well.